What's up, everybody? Happy Monday morning. I hope everyone is ready to dive in to these hearings that happened last week. Brian Koberger, his team, the state, their team, some DNA experts, some lawyers, all had something to say about this Brian Koberger case and what evidence is discoverable, what could potentially be found and used with this evidence and why the state believes they either shouldn't get it or can't get it. Uh, a lot of answers came from this hearing. I talked on Twitter. I think I talked on stream about how this was actually a really important hearing for a number of reasons. Number one, we're going to find out if we think it's even possible for this case to go to trial October 2nd. And we're going to find out if the judge and the lawyers think it's possible. And regardless of what they say, I think we get a pretty good look into what they all actually think. Number two, whether or not this evidence is important. I think we got that answer from this hearing. Number three, what's left to do? Number four, when will we have some finality on experts, alibis, and even the speedy trial waiver? And whether or not I think the judge may have overstepped what he can actually do in that scenario. Because whenever it comes to criminal defendants, their constitutional rights have to be protected. And there are certain things even the judge can't do, which may be found to violate those constitutional rights. So we're going to talk about all that and more. We're going to talk about what the judge thinks about Brian Koberger's alibi, what the judge thinks about this evidence. Um, we're going to talk about that all today. We're going to watch a few clips. We're not going to watch the witness testimony. We read, oof, we read through most of those declarations and affidavits from the DNA experts and the IgG experts. So we're not going to listen to all their testimony. But I do want to give a shout out to Alex Capriello, um, who was in the courtroom and kind of live tweeting it. We're going to read some of his tweets about the DNA evidence and about some of the arguments back and forth and talk through it. Thank you, Stacy, so much. Um, but I want to focus a lot on the lawyer arguments and the judge's orders, because when we really talk through what we learn at these hearings, a lot of it comes down to that. And a lot of it comes down to us reading between the lines to figure out what they actually think and where this case is going. So for old time's sake, and because the audio is so bad on these videos, I actually have the old headphones here that I'm going to, you know, wear the old school way so that I can make sure I actually hear what's saying. We are going to play it on one time speed, which is how, you know, it's hard to hear. And literally my least favorite way to listen to anything, um, on just normal speed, but hit that like button. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our page. We're going to continue to break down this stuff. Um, we'll talk about the outcomes of the motions, uh, where we kind of gave what we thought was going to happen and whether or not we were right or wrong and why, and what we learned from what we were right about and what we were wrong about. Okay. So to start out, let's, we're going to start with part one here, um, on the way, at least the way East Idaho news set them up. I believe this is where we're starting. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So um, they start out arguing specifically about, you know, who has what. The FBI has these things. They're not necessarily going to turn them over. We can't control the FBI. Um, you know, we've given them everything. And that's what the state said multiple times. We've given them everything. And the judge is like, well, you've got to have some trust in this process. And we're going to kind of listen to some of that back and forth, specifically talking about the DNA evidence, the motion to compel, this is all before the witnesses testified. So this is just kind of setting up that testimony. Then we'll talk through that testimony and the outcomes of what, what we know and what we don't know at this point. The action to Mr. Kobe. Correct. Any response? Um, Your Honor, we didn't realize this was going to be an issue today. We had given the defense everything that we received from the lab. They've asked for DNA workups on other people. To the extent that they don't have them, they weren't done. Uh, we can't produce something that doesn't exist. We provide everything. There's one outstanding lab report uh, that relates to the forensic examination by the lab personnel of 
crime scene itself. He received the dead. That's the only outstanding lab report. Everything else along with all the notes is what there is and to provide defense. So they've given him everything. Now he's going to say certain things. Now my headphones weren't working, so I'm just going to keep doing it from the computer as best I can, even though it doesn't hear, uh, it doesn't sound great. All right. Yes, I will turn closed captions on. It's my bad. Um, but when we talk about these situations, this is not uncommon where the defense says, give us this. And the state says, we don't have it. Either law enforcement didn't give it to them. The FBI didn't feel like they had to give it to them. Whenever the FBI is involved, stuff like that happens, especially in federal cases. There are certain things the judge is just like, you're not going to get this. Seems completely unfair, but sometimes that does happen. So we will continue to listen to them argue back and forth about what has been given and what exists and what doesn't exist. If they, they, they're hoping that there's something else there, it's not there. The defense says they're hoping that something else is there and it's not there. More on that later. Well, remember, it's part of my third motion to compel. It's still something that we don't have. We also don't have the unexpected corrective actions, unexpected results from the Idaho State Police Forensics Lab for the six months before and the six months after November 14th. We did get some, but it's a narrow scope, and we asked for the full year, six months before and six months after. That's also in our motion. I understand uh, your responsibility is to turn over every rock. Uh, but you can't get things that don't exist as well. So, I mean, there has to be some level of trust in discovery. You're all uh, sworn attorneys. And so Mr. Thompson would say that there will be one more lab uh, report that is coming your way today, I heard him say. Not, maybe not today. We are waiting to receive it so that we can process it for discovery. It's supposed to be in any time. Okay. So he's like, you're going to get something else today. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe not today because we got to process it through discovery. What does that mean? Process it through discovery. Well, see if it's discoverable. See if we're going to object. See if we need to file a motion for protective order. See if we need to redact anything. See if any edits need to be made. That's what he means by process it through discovery. They also need to, may need to bait stamp it, put it in its proper place and file where they need to in their system. And they do all of that before they turn it over to the defense. So he's like, it may not be today. Understood that, so it's coming soon. It has to come soon because we're six weeks away from a trial. So, and this is, I think, the first mention the judge says, Okay, fine, I misunderstood, it's not coming today, but it's coming soon, and it has to be coming soon because we are six weeks away from trial. Somebody asked what bait stamping is. Bait stamping is like, it's B-A-T-E-S, just like putting a number at the bottom. So it's, you know, when you have a terabyte and thousands of documents, you number them one to 1,733 or whatever it is. So they can say bait stamp number 76 and everybody knows what document you're talking about when there's a lot of discovery. Um, sometimes you'll bait stamp it like that. But this is the first of many, I don't know if I'll call them warning shots, but mentions and stern mentions of this trial being six weeks away and whether or not is it even it is even possible to get all this done between now and then. So, uh, we're going to be very rushed about a lot of things. But I'm going to talk about that a little more. We're going to talk about it later, but we are going to be rushed. The judge says that over and over again, and we'll hear from the state about how we're going to be rushed. And this is what happens. I think some people are going to be surprised. It's like, wait a second. It's a criminal defendant. He's presumed innocent. He has a right to a fair trial. He has a right to a speedy trial. That's the rule. Six months. So why is everybody acting like it's Brian Koberger's fault that we're going to be rushed? And partially I can say, okay, you may be right. And that's part of the frustration about the state not producing discovery. If it is in fact discoverable. Because he only has six months. And we're going to connect those dots a little later in the video. Um, so what about the other uh, claim, Mr. Thompson? Do you want to address that? Uh, the other uh, mistakes? Uh, Corrective action log, unexpected result log. We have that in part, but not the whole 
Uh, I don't know what exists that we haven't received. We we provided all the requests to the lab, and they've assured us that they have provided us with everything they have they have within the scope of those requests. I, I'm not sure what else to say. I mean, we can make a supplemental inquiry uh, to clarify that after the commission court today. Um, but. Uh, so he's like, listen, we don't have it. We can make a supplemental inquiry, which means ask again. And guess what? When the state does this, oftentimes more things pop up. That's very frustrating. And they're like, well, judge, we asked again. But guess what? Still a delay. Defense still gets it late. They have to react to it if it does exist. Now, it might not. There might be nothing. And then it is what it is. The state has, or the defense has everything the state has. I'm kind of sitting here saying, judge, excuse me, everything we know to exist. Well, that would, that would be wise to check on that. We will. Because we don't want this to come back on the, on the eve of trial. Yes, sir. Or, you know, four years from now at an appeal. Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry. I know some people are probably getting annoying at how often I'm stopping it, but this is important stuff and it's hard to hear. The judge makes a very subtle comment there that's very important. We don't want this to come up the eve of trial. Meaning, Oh, we made a supplemental inquiry judge and the day before trial, the FBI turned over a hundred pages of reports. We plan on using these at trial. Well, either they're going to get thrown out because it's past the discovery deadline, or if he's going to allow them, now the defense has a very good argument that this is not a fair trial and he's not going to waive his right to speedy trial. So they either violated his right to speedy trial or they're going to go to trial with evidence that's unfair and should not be able to be used by the state. And we do not want that problem on the eve of trial. That's why demanding a speedy trial puts so much pressure on the state and on law enforcement. And I see some questions in here. I really wanted to wait till the end. Um, Tammy said, but Brian is controlling it by not waiving his right to a speedy trial. He wants to get it going. So whether his team is ready or not, if he doesn't waive, it's go time. This is a backwards way of looking at it, Tammy. And Daniela Kay said, if the state feels like they're going to be rushed, then why didn't they wait to charge him? I think they assumed he would waive his right to speedy trial. So the state actually had all the control. Brian Koberger cannot, cannot control when the speedy trial clock starts. Only the state can. And the state even moved it up than when it was planned with the preliminary hearing. So they started the clock. And Brian Koberger, on the other hand, and what he's controlling is really only his right to take this case to trial and not have it spin out of control like we've seen with Sarah Boone, for example, where it just is delay and continuance after continuance, and she has no control anymore. And Brian Co Koberger would just be sitting there waiting for everybody else to be ready for trial, and it could be three years down the road. So the state controlled the timeline, not Brian Koberger, and we have literally seen in other cases, this really can spin out of control um, if you don't continue to press towards trial, and that's why you need to have an open discovery process. So we want to make sure that we have come through all the information that has any bearing or argu you know, argument of bearing on this case. Uh, that's all. So. James make, making a note right now. We'll send the inquiry out later tonight. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Your Honor, just for a point of clarification, we all also ask for all emails, text messages, along with electronic messages or other messages. Um, some have been provided, uh, but we don't have assurance that that's all. And so for the, for the same reason, we want to make sure that we have the complete part. Okay, we have told them, we have given them everything that we know to exist. We've asked the lab, the lab provided to them. At this point, all I'm hearing is speculation is they think maybe or they wish something else was there. But as far as we know, it doesn't exist. I don't we have told them we've given them everything. All I hear is speculation and we think something may exist. And at another point in the hearing, he says something like, so if the FBI messed up a little bit, does that mean we have to give everything in every investigation for all time? It's like, that's not the question. The question is, is it discoverable? And if you're saying it doesn't exist, then it doesn't matter if they're speculating. It doesn't matter. Nothing else matters if it doesn't exist. So you just stop the argument there. The judge is never going to make you turn something over that doesn't exist. But he continues to argue like they're speculating and whatever, but you know, this stuff doesn't exist. Like, well, if it doesn't exist, you do not need to make another argument as a lawyer. If you're not going to discover something and you're not going to use it at trial and it does not exist, 
then there shouldn't be any issue. But if it does exist now, you have created a slew of issues. I don't know what else we can say. We, we can't respond to something that isn't real. Sorry, Judge. I mean, we're, we're just sorting it out. Yes, sir. Making sure that everything that there is uh, is shared. We'll Except make, for the ones that you don't want to Absolutely. Share. Yes, sir. And that's one of the reasons for it. We'll make an, an additional inquiry to the lab to see if there's anything else in the form of emails that they haven't already provided to us. I, I would add, I mean, there there are times, okay, in the world of the law that sometimes people forget to do things or sometimes uh, things fall through the cracks. And so it's always, always uh, healthy to make sure that it's done early. Absolutely. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. All right. So then they kind of get into the DNA evidence. And instead of listening to all that, I'm going to bring up some tweets here that give us kind of a synopsis. And I want to hit some points here. Um, taking a seat, faint smile. We'll just, and we'll take them out of order because it doesn't really matter. Vargas is discussing investigative investigative techniques that law enforcement officers do. And she literally says the only thing stopping law enforcement from breaking these rules and using DNA in situations where people have not consented to it, or they're not supposed to is basically the honor system. That's basically what it is. And she knows for a fact, law enforcement circumvents that honor system on occasion. Now she said she was torn and um, she details the workarounds and loopholes that exist. She struggles with this. It's an ethical dilemma for her because she's worked with law enforcement, obviously seen this happen, knows that it's wrong. Barlow and Mercer were the lawyers that were called as experts. And they basically went through why you need this IgG DNA stuff, what type of arguments you can make, how you need it to determine what experts you're going to call, how you need it for potential Fourth Amendment and suppression issues, which would indicate that maybe the defense thinks something is there for them to suppress this evidence and get it thrown out altogether. I haven't heard anything that really compels me to believe that. But the argument the state made here, I actually fully 100% agree with. And, and actually, the judge disagrees with me, so it's interesting. But the state makes this argument like, judge, these two lawyers are being called as experts. Now, they're not DNA experts. I get that. You can call experts for other reasons. But literally, all these lawyers are really doing is making arguments that the public defenders or, or Koberger's defense attorneys could just make from counsel table. None of what they're really saying is evidence. None of what they're really saying is expertise any more than my arguments are as a lawyer. Like that's what lawyers do. It's like judge. There have been cases where they've taken this IgG and they found it was, they used the wrong database or it was collected incorrectly or the chain of custody was broken and therefore it was contaminated or the evidence, the trace DNA was transferred from here to there. And we can only prove that if we get this information, that's all legal argument, which is exactly what the state said. But the judge, so the judge said, we're not going to talk about the law. We're going to talk about legal argument necessarily. I just want to hear about the DNA part of this. So basically they're going to tell him, this is what the DNA is. This is how we've used it in the past. This is what we can find out if we get it. To me, the most important uh, aspect of this is we need to know what experts to even call judge. We need to so know if there are issues. We need to talk to our experts about those issues. So if we don't even know the basic information, it's impossible for us to do this. And to me, that is, that is important. And the fact that law enforcement can work around it is important. And the other DNA expert, again, gives background. What is it? What's IgG? How do we use it to connect the dots? Yeah, here we go. Prosecution, the mere possibility, this is the quote I mentioned earlier, 
the mere possibility that the FBI violated the terms of service shouldn't be enough to force disclosure of the information or else you will run into the issue of having to show the entire investigation, every case. Judge says, because this is a death penalty case, he doesn't want to make it through the full trial only to hear during an appeal process that the defense did not have documents that they should have had, in which case everyone will be accused of being bad lawyers. So this is when we didn't get a ruling on this, just in case anybody that thought we got a ruling on um, on the DNA evidence. The judge has, has a reserved ruling. I expect to get it early this week because, again, when we get to the scheduling order and how quickly all this needs to go. But there were indications to me, and what my guess was before the hearing is that the judge is at least going to grant this partially and force the state to turn over more of this IgG evidence. Will it be to the amount that the defense thinks they're entitled to? I don't know that answer but I feel very confident the judge is going to force the state to turn over something and more. And the fact that the state's like, so if they violated the terms of service, that means we're going to have to do this on every investigation. It's like, yeah, what's the problem with that? What's the problem with turning over the investigation to make sure they did it right? That's like what defense lawyers are there for. To hold the state's feet to the fire so law enforcement does not step on your rights. And I realize a lot of people don't like Brian Koberger or think he did it. And that's fine if that's where you're at. But this is the slippery slope argument. Some people don't like when lawyers make slippery slope arguments, but we do this and then all of a sudden they're allowed to just tap into your phone whenever they want to and read all your text messages and whatever. It's like, well, I mean, if we want to do that, I mean, we, we found that he, you know, threatened somebody via text. So, I mean, it was worth it because we got the guy, right? It's like, that wasn't a real threat. You can't tell the context from my text. But if you get a good enough prosecutor on the other side, maybe they can convict you based off that text that they were able to just tap into your phone and violate your rights and get. So we just don't want to give law enforcement opportunities to circumvent the rules. Not that they all do, but like any profession, there's good and there's bad. And that's why it's always important to make sure everybody plays by the rules, not just you and I, but everybody. And I think that's very important. So lady law said, what if the state does not have all they're asking for? Well, I think some of it was at least hinted at in other documents and probable cause affidavits and things that have been filed that at least some of this exists. And that's why I said, I think they, they're at least going to have to produce something or maybe reverse engineer how they built the family tree, what they did, what they went through. Again, the weird thing to me is what are they finding out during depots? Are they doing depots? Um, and are they getting more information from that? Cause I haven't, I haven't, um, seen or heard them mention depots. Okay, here we go again, Lisa, uh, not here we go again, but this is something I wanted to mention. And I knew you guys were going to ask the right questions. And, and after we watch this, a couple of these chunks, I really want you to ask as many questions as you have because I think that's going to be the best way to, to hit all the information that actually came out of this hearing. I think the best format is actually a Q&A. Um, how can the state argue the three additional DNA samples don't exist when they were determined to be identified as male samples? I don't know if they said they don't exist, but I don't think they ran them through CODIS. I don't know why they didn't run them through CODIS. I think the defense has the right to this information at the very least for cross-examination and to bring up reasonable doubt. If the state only tested Brian Koberger's DNA and none of the other three unidentified males, I think that's sketchy. I think that's problematic. And I think a jury might think the same thing. And I think that could be very, very important information. All right. Um... All right, so let's get into the state's motion to reconsider the stay. We're going to jump to the judge's comments, and we're going to skip ahead to some more judicial comments and what he thinks. And we know that the state has already gotten a stay from the judge of 37 days uh, because of a first grand jury issue. Now they provided an affidavit with more information-ish on the grand jury issue. So we'll see what the what the court thinks about that. My understanding is that I'm not going to kind of piecemeal it along the way. Thank you, Your Honor. I mean, the only reason I granted that in the first place is because uh, they didn't they do have a right to get the 
grand jury uh, transcripts and materials. They didn't have it yet, so that was the only way I could uh, make, make do that to let them uh, go through that material, which apparently they now have. So, all right. Who's arguing this one? Okay, Mr. Lofton. So the judge said, I already granted it specifically for them to go through the grand jury transcript. Then the defense gets up again, argues more of it out. They're going to they're gonna handle that motion to dismiss the grand jury indictment at a later date. We'll get to that more when we get to the scheduling order. I'm going to jump ahead again to more of the judge's comments because I think that's where we learn the most here. Six weeks away, I mean, we're all on the bus. It's really challenging, no doubt. So again, he mentions we're six weeks away. It's going to be really challenging. You can, I mean, the skepticism is just oozing out of the judge throughout this hearing. Everybody's ready for it. Great. Uh, okay, any response? Your Honor, I would just, I, I, I think just for if, if nobody intends to utilize this order, I, I guess I don't see the harm in just rescinding it uh, so that we have some predictability as we're planning ahead. We've subpoenaed many of our witnesses. We're looking at making travel arrangements that would give us some predictability if the court, if nobody intends to, to utilize this order anyway, it seems like it would be a no harm no foul situation, which is with a lot of respect. Thank you. Good point made by the state. Everybody seems to be in agreement right now, October 2nd. And, and this is when we start to just, in the back of our mind, remember this, okay? So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in my thoughts. Ann Taylor asks for a status hearing this Wednesday, I think. So less than a week from the hearing we're currently watching, she wants a status hearing. If you notice, they make an argument about the motion to stay. The judge, judge ends up denying their second motion to stay and basically calling the first motion to stay moot because they're not using it. They're not using that 37 days. Now, I think there's an argument that if they said, um, judge, we had to take time in preparing this grand jury, this motion to dismiss the grand jury indictment. We had to review the grand jury materials. So we need those extra days to prepare this case. They didn't make that argument. They didn't fight very hard against the motion to stay basically being rescinded. So to me, it almost feels like Ann Taylor and team, they're the only ones that as we start arguing about scheduling and when this and when that, Thompson's fighting about stuff and pushing deadlines up. The judge is saying we're going to have to stay late. We're going to have to work through these problems. The judge is saying all of that, but Ann Taylor's not really. So does this indicate that they are going to waive speedy trial? Does this indicate that maybe Ann Taylor and team knows something that we don't? And if she does, and if they do plan to waive speedy trial, there could be a strategic reason why they don't do it right now, but they do it much closer to the September 8th deadline. And we'll talk about that when we get to the scheduling order specifically. Stacy K, thank you so much for this uh, super chat. I definitely lean towards guilt, but that's even more of a reason to ensure his rights are protected. I wouldn't want a guilty person to be able to appeal because their rights were violated. 100%. And that is why if you lean towards guilt, that's fine. You're looking at the evidence, you're playing juror at this point, and you're saying, I think that there is enough evidence here to prove that he did it. And I like that you said lean towards guilt, not that you're already there because we haven't seen it all. And I think there's going to be a lot more that comes out in trial than we've seen so far. But even if you lean towards guilt, the only way this is done right is to protect his rights, to turn over all the evidence, to give him the time he needs to prepare the case while also not making him rot in prison for years and years and years while not proving that he's guilty, right? That's not the system we want to set up. We don't want to rush to judgment where it wasn't fair. He wasn't able to prepare his case, but we also don't want five years down the road where maybe witnesses start to forget things. 
um, the situation changes, which happens in cases sometimes, and it can become harder to defend yourself when it's years down the road. So I think this is perfectly said. If people are starting to get a lean, you're human, right? We're listening to evidence. We're listening about cell phones. We're listening to DNA evidence. So I totally understand that. Thank you for the comment, Stacey. All right. I'm going to jump ahead for some more discussion from the judge here. Again, the judge comments, I'm thinking about how short the time is we have now. And I just wanted, I mean, I didn't even get all of them, right? I didn't even put all of the clips in when he mentioned it, but it was mentioned a lot by him and by the state, not as much by the defense. Case law, looked at the statute, um, and I, I know that you, uh, your team has looked over the transcripts and the materials. I know that uh, I believe Mr. Thompson was there. Uh, they, was time. they don't have that advantage of uh, knowing what happened. I wasn't there, I haven't looked at this material. Uh, and based on what has been presented, I'm not I'm not uh, persuaded that there is a substantial failure to comply with this attack. I just I just don't see it. I think these are sort of typical things that we see all the time with jurors. Uh, it's not unusual for the, the number of jurors that we ask to show up don't show up. Um, I don't I don't think it's that unusual. And so uh, some of the concerns that, uh, that Mr. Coburger cites um, very well could have been co uh, corrected uh, with some questions. Uh, I don't know. So I'm going to deny the motion. Uh, and connecting to the earlier sort of order to allow the defense to get the transcripts, give you time to get the transcripts, to get the materials to the grand jury. I think that that purpose has been satisfied. Uh, that's the reason I ordered that in the first place, to give you uh, all a chance to look at uh, what actually happened to the grand jury. So, again, I'm not, uh, at this point, uh, not satisfied with uh, the standard by a substantial value to comply. So pretty much exactly what we thought. He doesn't think it rises to the level of substantial failure. And because... Uh, the 37 days is kind of moot at this point because nobody seems to need it. And because he doesn't think the, he thinks the affidavit was too vague. Basically um, he is denying the second motion to stay. And again, where we were wrong is it sounds like he did reconsider the first motion to stay and rolled it back. He actually announces he's going to roll back that first motion to stay. So that's the one that we were wrong on. I expected him just to deny it and leave that 37 day buffer. But it almost seems like I'm getting the feeling that the judge is also trying to pressure the defense to tell him like, we're going to trial October 7th. Second, a, a line has been drawn in the sand. I'm working nights. I'm clearing it more on that later. I, I'm, I, I'm really excited to get to the scheduling order. Cause I think we learned so much when they start discussing scheduling. Um, next we move into the motion, uh, to compel the alibi, which again, we get another little peek at what the judge thinks about this, but I'm going to jump ahead a couple minutes here to discuss that. But at this point, 
this point, it's too late for the defense to comply with the statute and identify specifically people and their addresses who justify. So that's where we stand out there. Thank you. Okay, Judge. All right. Your Honor, I believe provided to the prosecutor what we can provide to the prosecutor and more. What does that sound like? So I left that clip in there because the state's like, hey, we need more information. If this is really an alibi, finally they gave us a little bit more. That's what the state said. Finally they gave us a little bit more, at least that he was driving out, and that maybe Mr. Koberger testified to it or cross-examination or expert witnesses, but they haven't given us enough. Where specifically was he? It's not technically an alibi without specifically where he was, not that he was just kind of driving around. And what does the defense say? Judge? We have given the state everything we can provide to the state and more. That literally sounds like what the state said to the defense a few short hours ago at this point, where they said it's, it is what it is, Judge. We can't produce something that doesn't exist. So can we read that same comment into what the defense said here? Well, we can't produce something that doesn't exist. So if there's no corroborating materials or witnesses that can say where he was or give him an alibi it is what it is. And we've provided what we can provide to the state. We, I think that Mr. Thompson's right. We don't have to tell the prosecutor if Brian's going to testify or what Brian needs to say. We have indicated that we would, that it's possible that we would have additional things that might come out through expert testimony and cross-examination the state's experts. I don't have documentation to give to the state today. I am not going to go into any more of that at this moment. I understand when October 7th is. I definitely understand that. I've heard everybody's thoughts and concerns. I, I get that. But I, She's heard everybody's thoughts and concerns, and she gets it about the October trial date. I mean, that, this is what we have, and when there's more, I will tell this is what we have, and when there's more, she'll produce it. Now, when we go through the scheduling order, the judge is going to put a deadline on that, but it's one of the things I think it's going to be really tough for him to hold that deadline. Your Honor, with all respect, that is exactly what the rule and the statute are designed to prohibit. So now is when Thompson takes some more shots at the defendant. He's like, Judge, that's exactly what the rule prohibits. So... And this is where the gamesmanship comes in. Nobody wants to think that one side's not turning over something that they know is discoverable. But the state's pushing really hard for the alibi. And it sounds like the defense is saying, sorry, yeah, the state's pushing really hard for the alibi, but also pushing really hard against turning over some discovery. So maybe the defense is saying, judge, when they turn over more discovery, then we may have more additional information about the alibi. And the, the state's about to stand up and say, this is exactly what they can't do. Get more evidence and fabricate, is the word he uses, an alibi. And again, the scheduling order is going to provide answers on that, on who's actually right, who has to provide what first. As the U.S. Supreme Court observed in Taylor versus Williams, the ease with which an alibi can be fabricated. The defense is waiting to gather up evidence, seeing what they can fabricate, to match that evidence, say, oh, by the way, here's the alibi now. That is specifically what's prohibited by the statute, by the rule, by the comments of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and Williams versus Florida. You know, trials are not yet a poker game where players enjoy an absolute right to always conceal their cards and full play. And, and that's what's going on here. And that's what a lot of people in the chat were saying when he said he was driving around. I was like, isn't that convenient? It matches what is already in the discovery and some agreed upon evidence at this point. And the state does not want him to be able to do that. We have cases where they weren't, won't turn over the video of an accident or, you know, uh, uh, something falling on top of our client, or they won't turn that over before our client's deposition because they don't want our client to be able to review the video before to, uh, getting their deposition taken. What's the story? You were there. You should be able to tell us the story. You don't need the video. And so it's like, what's first, chicken or the egg? And the state's like, we need the alibi. 
yeah, we're objecting to all this discovery. We need the alibi. Defense is like, we need the discovery. And then if there's more to the alibi, we'll provide it. This happens a lot of times in, in cases like this. That's why the rule exists. Just need to cut it off and we'll move forward. The defendant can justify to his own alibi. That's what he wants to do. But it violates the rule, the statute, and the rights of the state to a fair trial uh, to allow third party evidence, whether by direct or cross. The way I understand this uh, is, and this is in the so-called alibi, not really an alibi. So the judge says, in this so-called alibi, with air quotes, and then he says, it's not really an alibi. So that's what he thinks about Brian Koberger's alibi at this point. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do because the next the next motion is for a scheduling order. Uh, I'm going to address this uh, in terms of the camera. We'll see we'll see how that goes. Right now, that is as far as Mr. Koberger wants to go with the continue outline. So he basically said, that's fine if that's as far as he's going to go, but we're going to mention that again in the scheduling order. So did you hear that part? I read the Albert case. Defense had witnesses that were going to testify. Judge didn't allow them, and it was overturned. That's why I've kind of been saying all along, if a week before trial the defense presents an alibi witness, it's going to be tough for this judge to strike them. Now, he may, and he is going to set a deadline. Again, it's funny, right? Because when the state demands the alibi, there's a time period they have to present it. The defense presents it on the last day. It's not good enough. So the state compels it. Defense provides another one, but another 10 days or 20 days have gone by. Well, now the judge is going to set a deadline a couple weeks down the road. So all these deadlines just keep getting pushed down the road, and that happens all the time, especially when you're talking about a criminal defendant. A criminal defendant has rights, and I firmly believe if he produced, uh, somebody asked me this question here, Ms. Kelly, but Peter, it's possible he was driving around, could be on surveillance elsewhere, but pinging near to the house, not in it. Sure. And if that video exists and the defense produces it three days before trial, I think it's coming in. I honestly think it's coming in. I think it should in the interest of justice. Now, I do think the state should have the opportunity to have somebody look at it. So maybe three days, maybe it is enough time. You know, see, is, is, has it been doctored? Is it authenticated? Is it his car? Can they bring an expert to say it's not his car? So maybe that's why we have some kind of, you know, delay or stay or whatever it may be. I think there can be a small continuous before we actually hit the speedy trial period. But I think if they come up with legitimate alibi evidence, it's going to be let in. You just heard about that case he mentioned where witnesses were struck and the conviction was overturned. And that's the last thing anybody wants. Yeah, I know. Maybe it's uh, then there, there, uh, Perez, uh, that was 2021. That was a court of appeals. And uh, he said, I'm a lot. You know. So, uh, Jimmy Taylor, you acknowledge that potential risk to your client in the greatest. Response to the request. So there's, you know, there's some potential. Uh, so I think the last 
this assignment. All right, now we get to the scheduling order where we get a lot of things answered here. He thought the case was going to be pushed out because there were so many issues as did I, as did many of you, as did many people commenting on this. I still believe that that is the most likely scenario. And I get it. I'm kind of being pushed into a corner. I'm, I'm on an island kind of by myself because of how this looks and how everybody's really pushing this towards a speedy trial and towards that October 2nd trial date. And I don't know if it's going to be a long delay. Maybe still within a speedy trial period. Maybe within that 37 days, they may go back to that stay of some sort. But I would be shocked still if this case goes to trial October 2nd. Again, I may be alone in that. I may be alone. But this scheduling order makes me think it even more. And the judge was surprised it hadn't been pushed out yet. Uh, I understand And I'll just tell you, he's kind of giggling because he does this every single day. He knows how hard this is. He knows how long this stuff takes. He knows how nearly impossible it's going to be to st stick to this schedule. He's not being flippant about it. He's saying, this is a reality check. And that's been his attitude the whole time. Like, are you guys going to be ready for this? Even on the defense side, are you sure you're going to be ready for this? And the state, you know, as, as you hear throughout the schedule, you see the state is not very happy about this timeline either. And I'm, I'm going off of uh, Mr. Thompson's uh, motion, and maybe added, added a couple of things, but deadlines for completion of discovery, September 1st. So that's the first big one. Completion of discovery, I believe not including expert discovery. We'll keep listening. Yeah. Sorry, Lori. Great idea. Don't forget to like the stream. Let's get to 5,000 likes here as we're watching. Um, September 1st, discovery cutoff. What does that mean? Well, we're going to get more clarification later, but at the very least, it means all the text messages lab reports, emails, IgG evidence, all the stuff they've asked for, filed these motions to compel on, must be turned over by September 1st. There will be no more judge. It has to be processed through discovery and we'll get it to them soon. Not tomorrow, but soon. There will be no more of that. Everything needs to be discovered by September 1st. Now, what are the sanctions? If you do not turn something over in discovery before the discovery cutoff? Well, the first sanction usually, and federal courts stick to this to a T. I was in the middle of trial one time and the defense tried to enter something. It wasn't a big deal, but I was like, judge, they never discovered it. So we didn't have an opportunity to really look at it or prepare for it. Judge is like, is that true defense counsel? Did you not discover it? And they're like, yeah, judge, it didn't get put in discovery. She's like, it's out. Didn't think twice about it. Federal court, they stick to the rules a little, a little closer. But um, here, if you don't discover it, Theoretically, the sanction could be then you can't use it at trial. That's a big sanction. However, if it's IgG DNA stuff that the state says is not important and they're not going to use anyway, do they really care if they don't turn it over by September 1st? And then, oh no, we can't use it at trial. You've seen that meme. It's like, oh no, oh no. And they're laughing. It's like, don't threaten me with a good time. We can't use it at trial. That's what we don't want anyway. There are other sanctions, of course, if they don't do that. But what often happens in discovery as well is you ask for something, they object to it, and then when they turn over the answers or the documentation, whatever it is you're, they're compelled to give from the judge, many times it's still not complete. 
And that opens up other questions. So if the judge compels them to turn this IgG stuff over, how in the world is the defense going to analyze it, go through it, produce whatever discovery they have in response or ask for more? If it, Like I already told you, if an email references somebody or an email references, hey, based on that text message, we're going to go ahead and use the IgG or go into this database. It's like, well, state, we need this text message that's referenced in the email. Therefore, we need more discovery. And is the state going to object and file a motion for protective order on that? Say, judge, that's work product, or that's outside the scope of your motion to or of your uh, granting of their motion to compel. And now we have to have another hearing and fight about it and see whether or not that discovery needs to be turned over. So a September 1st discovery deadline is wild when they still don't even agree as to what is discoverable. Now, we always get there eventually, a lot of times with a lot of help from the judge. But just that first deadline of September 1st seems almost impossible for them to get all this discovery turned over and for the defense to agree that this is all the discovery. And so what happens if the state violates that or if they don't turn something over and the defense asks the judge and the judge ends up being like, that is discoverable. Well, is that a violation of Brian Koberger's speedy trial rights? They violated a court order. They violated the scheduling order. They didn't turn over discovery in time. And it's discovery we need that we think is going to be good for us that's in their possession. You start creating major problems and potential appellate issues. Now, the judge can try to cure by kicking the case down a little bit. You know, like I said, I think there's a couple weeks after October 2nd that are within the speedy trial period. So maybe they use that time. Maybe they use the 37 day stay. Maybe they get creative. Maybe they say, state, you've got 24 hours to turn all this stuff over. And it's only been two or three days. So it's not that big of a prejudice or a harm. But I just can foresee issues like that, that I think that's one of the reasons Ann Taylor has not, has not waived speedy trial yet for Ryan Koberger. Because you want to hold their feet to the fire. And if they make a screw up, you have the motion that the state has violated his right to a speedy trial. I think she might file that regardless and say because of the state's inaction, because of the dragging of their feet, because they refuse to turn over relevant discovery, they have violated his right to speedy trial. It is impossible for us to prepare this case in six months, which is his right, because of the state's actions. Let's listen to some more of the dates. Deadlines for expert disclosures under Rule uh, 16B7 and C4, September 8th. If expert disclosures... Yeah, so the expert discovery is due September 8th. Okay, so why is that important? Well, if they turn over this DNA stuff and they drag it out until September 1st, that's only one week for the experts to be discovered. And what's their reporting going to be? And who are they going to call? And they got to hire them and have them go through it. Then the state will have some time. I think it's like seven days or something, depending on how Idaho does it, to give their rebuttal experts. I mean, you're just jamming all of this in here. How can you possibly prepare the case appropriately to cross-examine these experts, which then you use your experts to help prepare for cross-examining their experts? And they're going to be doing this while discoveries do, and we've got a thousand jurors coming in in two weeks. Rule uh, 16B7 and C4, September 8th. If there is an actual alibi, uh, then... Once again, which would mean there's not an actual alibi right now. It's required under Rule 12-1 and 19-519, September 8th. So now we've extended the alibi deadline out another three weeks or however many weeks that is to September 8th just keeps getting kicked down the road. I told you this is all judicial discretion. So I knew the fact that he didn't provide one in the first place was not going to make it so he couldn't provide one later. He can still provide one. And I would even submit that if he provided one on September 9th or 12th, the judge would still accept it and allow him to use it at trial. Deadlines for pretrial motions including motions of limity, motions related to the death penalty, and other motions under Rule 12B. 
And I'm going to say also, if your client, uh, Ms. Taylor, decides to wait to the trial, I'm going to have a deadline in September. So waiver of speedy trial is September 8th. I didn't think that's the motion deadline. I think the motion deadline is August or sorry, uh, September 23rd, but we'll keep, keep listening. So this is the one I wanted to pause on real quick. So the speedy trial deadline to waive speedy trial is September 8th, about just less than a month before trial. And this is the one right here that I think it is almost impossible for the judge to hold the defendant to. Because let's just say the state drags their feet on providing discovery, drags their feet on rebuttal experts, objects to the defendant's experts. If the defendant says, judge, we literally don't have what we need for this trial, so I'm willing to waive my right to a speedy trial on October 1st because it is impossible for my team to prepare they will not be competent counsel in one day based on how slow the state has been giving us this stuff. So they'll probably file a motion that the state violated speedy trial rights, which we already talked about. But if they want to waive speedy trial October 1st, I, a, a case may exist, but I am not aware of any judge denying the defense's ability to waive his right to a speedy trial for good cause shown. And good cause shown would be my defense team is not prepared and cannot try this case in one day. It would be mind boggling for the judge to say too bad because we've cleared the court calendar and done all this work over the last two months. You can't waive your right to a speedy trial. I've never seen it done. Maybe it has, and it would make sense to try to put that pressure on the defendant. But I would be shocked if that actually happened. Because again, the defendant has rights. And his right to a fair trial is most important. So if he needs to waive speedy, I think he's going to be able to do it later, even though the judge might be pissed off and the state will definitely be pissed off if he does it. But let's, let's go back to what has to happen first, right? The chicken or the egg. Thompson's like, he can't construct his alibi based on more discovery and evidence. And the defense, sorry, the state said that Thompson and the defense said, judge, they need to produce this discovery. And if more comes out for our alibi, then we will produce our alibi. Thompson said, no, they've got to do that first. They, no, you got to do that first. Well, let's look at what the judge said. And this is based on, some of it's based on Thompson's scheduling order. But the judge said, all discovery due September 1st. That means the state and Mr. Thompson needs to produce discovery by September 1st. Which would then mean the defense has a whole week to go through whatever additional discovery there is before they produce their alibi by the new deadline set by the court. So the defense wins out there. The state has to produce discovery before the defense has to produce their alibi. And the state, you know, accusing the defense of trying to fabricate their alibi based on that discovery. Well, that's how the timeline is right now. Discovery comes first, then the alibi. Because there's going to be a lot of work that was his rationale for giving a deadline to waive speedy trial deadlines for responses to the motions september 15th deadlines for oh wait maybe that was september 8th then for the motions and then responses by september 15th i mean that's just wild proposed jury questionnaires, September 15th. Deadlines for proposed witnesses under rules 11, or excuse me, 16B6 and C3, September 15th. Deadline for any rule 404B notices, September 15th. We'll hear all the motions uh, clear out the whole day, September 22nd at 10 a.m. All right, so the 22nd was when they're going to hear the motions, not when they had to be filed. I'll call it first steps for death penalty qualified jury selection. I'm, I'm carving out 
September 25, 26, and 27. We don't know if that's enough. That would be pretty quick. I think three days to go through a thousand jurors and see who's death penalty qualified. But we're on a sped up schedule here. Final pretrial conference, September 29 at 10 a.m. Trial, October 2nd, starting 8.30 through November 17th. This is a tight schedule. You all know it. But we can do it. That's what everybody knows. I'm, I'm up for it. I'm going to clear out the deck for September. And again, there's a little, there's a little tinge to don't make me clear out this deck and then waive your speedy trial later. Like there is a little tinge to that and you can't blame anybody for that, but that's his right. And again, I would be shocked if he was ever not allowed to waive his right to speedy trial to continue the case if he needed it to prepare his case. But the, ju the judge is absolutely putting pressure that you better make that decision by September 8th. Don't make me clear my calendar for six weeks and then go back on it. And now we're stuck wasting more people's times on other cases that could have gone to trial during that time and didn't because we cleared it for your case. But the defendant, it's his only case. You know, everybody else can be annoyed about that, but um, it's kind of like what, uh, and somebody I thought commented that. Like if this was your case, you would want them to do everything to defend you. So there may be other things that come up, uh, including the, uh, the uh, if you want to set a hearing on the motion to dismiss the indictment at this point? So we to set that for hearing, but we have an additional motion to dismiss the grand jury indictment for um, various different grand This is when they're looking to set the motion to dismiss the grand jury indictment, which I think they set it on the 23rd or something. And there were scheduling issues because there's a specific state attorney handling that for them and a specific defense attorney. He's not available. What? Yes, sir. We're talking about potentially Net woman made this comment. Um, this is where the state said, judge, we don't want another four, 400 page motion where they go back in ancient history, which unfortunately we read together on stream. Um, but yeah, net woman, that was good. That was good. I was laughing hard at that as well. So Thompson lays a little bit of a hammer here. Again, this is all about pressure, about are you really going to be able to get this done in time? Thompson said that's September 1st, discovery deadline. That includes all sentencing mitigation, like mental health counselors, family members that come testify, text messages, journal entries, which psychiatric background, which we've heard some of about Brian Koberger. And if you think back to the Nicholas Cruz penalty trial, how much evidence and discovery for that months long just penalty phase, they've got to produce all of that discovery by September 1st too. That's what Thompson says. That's the deadline. 
and we've got to respond to it. If we're going to trial, we're going to trial. Let's do it. Bring it all. The judge ends up giving them until September 15th, so a little extra time, but not much. And the defense doesn't even really fight it. They don't stand up. They don't get mad. I mean, she's kind of cool, calm, and collected throughout the whole process, but the fact that they're not even trying to make arguments to push any of these deadlines further down the road, the fact that they didn't even try to use the 37 days tells me one of two things. Either they're ready to go October 2nd and they just don't think the state has the goods or they are planning on continuing the case eventually. And if they do, it may be, judge, we think they violated his right to speedy trial. So we're going to do that motion first. And if you deny it, then we have no chance but or no choice but to push it. But Thompson, throughout this entire hearing, was getting very upset about the timeline. Again, like somebody else made the comment, Brian Koberg is in control. He's not in control. This is just a right he has. And the state can't trample on it. The state chose when the timeline started. It was always going to be a potential of six-month timeline. Now, gamesmanship exists. So maybe the state said, oh, there's no way he can get this done in six months, so let's do it now, start the clock now, make it impossible for him. But that's not appropriate. Once we get going to trial, there's not going to be another break. I just want to make sure that the defense and we are clear that that's the line being drawn. I don't want to get um, balled up in some right. after the fact saying, oh, well, for purposes of sentencing, we want to call this expert, this mental health person, and these family friends and all that sort of stuff. That, that's not going to be appropriate post trial, post time trial starts. Well, figure out, I think this is what was discussed when we decided October 2nd is that the trial four weeks and then the sentencing would be two weeks. So during that period of uh, trial, I mean, remember, you know, a whole bunch of lawyers here. Maybe that's something that could be done. We wouldn't have to do that by With all respect, I don't think that's a realistic judge. This case is complicated. I think it's going to absorb the efforts of all the attorneys that are standing before you right now, just on the issue of, of guilt. Uh, and the state, of course. Thank you, Rebecca. Hope you're ready for the draft next week. Of course, you need to have time to react. Disclose sentencing experts. Um, it's going to disclose possible things about background, mental condition, uh, those sorts of things. Those are complicated, lengthy endeavors for us to respond to, including the possibility of having to retain other experts to rebut whatever the defense this coverter wants to offer. And I think if we're realistic about this timeline, we need to suck it up and be realistic about everything. That includes the defense stuff. I don't have a Mitigation is a huge complicated part of every capital case. I agree. It's a lot of discovery. We've seen it on YouTube cases. I mean, look at how defeated they all look. They're like, I just honestly don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how we're going to do it, but here's the timeline. Here's what we're working, Your Honor. Very busily working. Uh, I, I would suggest 
that, that maybe there could be a little more time for that. I mean, you need a deadline for, uh, for sentencing to put together by September 1st. We agree. We don't have time to work on anything else. Um, and including mitigation. All right, I think we've gotten the gist of it there. So there were a couple other things I wanted to hit. We're over an hour though. So I really want to get to your questions. So get your questions in now. I'm going to answer as many of them and weave in as many of the things I wanted to mention that I haven't mentioned yet as we fire through these questions. Anastasia, question. If the state never turns over the documentation they say doesn't exist, is there an equivalent to the negative inference, the jury instruction that was used in the Paltrow case? So no, not in this scenario because there's no necessary, there'd have to be wrongdoing found for a negative instruction to the jury. A negative inference instruction, but it can be used in cross-examination of the state witnesses and law enforcement witnesses. Like, why didn't you do this? You didn't keep notes. You destroy the notes after you do this. Does that make any sense? Well, there are loopholes, right? And it's just the honor system and nobody checked your work and you didn't turn your work over to us. We didn't get to check your work, right? That type of stuff can happen during cross. Unresolved crimes is multiple defense witnesses for the same argument, not pointing that it is indeed faulty. Usually it's not allowed. Usually you're only allowed one expert per specialty, um, so obviously there were different specialties that the judge at least felt these experts happen. It definitely doesn't prove it's faulty. Most lawyers would like to call 10 experts per point that they have to make, um, because they like to stack the deck as much as they can. Did Sarah Boone give up her right to speedy trial? Is that what got her in the delay? So yes, she says nobody told her, but something that she signed a lot of times defendants just wave it right off the jump. I waive my right to speedy trial, but then you get stuck sometimes. And, uh, and, and again, it's very obvious in that case, Sarah Boone does not want to continue this case yet. Everybody else in the courtroom does. And that very same thing could happen to Brian Koberger if he waves his. Welcome, Mina. And I saw a net woman just throwing out new memberships uh, along with some other people as well. You guys are awesome for that. Janet, question. Sorry if you addressed this already. How late in the process can Brian Koberger waive speedy trial? What is the deadline? Well, now it is September 8th, I believe. Um, but... I'd be very interested in how the judge plans to hold him to that. Belinda, this all seems like so much smoke and mirrors. Why are we arguing the method of obtaining DNA? We have it. It's at the crime scene. Go to trial already. It just seems like delayed tactics from the defense. So it's definitely not delayed tactics from the defense. Why not turn it over? That's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm on the other side of this. Fine. You want to know how we got here? Here. Here's how we got here. If we did it the right way, there should be no issues. But Ba uh, taking this logic a step further, which I know is not what you're saying, but that would mean a cop can just walk in your house whenever he wants. And as long as he finds that you did something wrong, then it's fine. And we don't care how he got in your house or your car or your kid's car or whatever it may be. And we just get rid of our rights at that point. Rubber toe. I don't know. Like if it was you in BK shoes, you wouldn't want your lawyer arguing for every shred of discovery that they, you wanted. People are so quick to give up their rights these days. This is the comment I was looking for before when I mentioned it. Yeah. I mean, if it's you, trust me, clients want every stone unturned and they deserve it. Uh, Shado. So what's the strategy to announcing the waiver speedy trial until last minute? I'm glad you asked. Karen asked the same question. Um, and then D Trugs asked, what are the odds? He waived speedy trial the day before the deadline. And I would say, I don't think if I was her, I would not waive it. I wouldn't waive it until the day before trial if I felt like there's no way we could go to trial. If the judge says, too bad, you got to go, then we go. You undertake that risk and you talk to your client. You say, listen, to be safe, we can waive it on September 8th. But if you want to risk it and still keep trying to push it, we can. But if we don't end up giving, getting everything we need, we can try again October 1st or September 30th or whatever. And if the judge says no, then we go and we have a really good appellate issue. Those are conversations you have with your clients. But the benefit of not waiving it until the last moment, either September 8th or closer to trial is the more you know and the more the state is forced to produce this stuff, like as an example, if the state is forced to produce their experts and you waive speedy trial, well, now they can delay. They don't have to produce their experts. They can say, judge, we'll give our experts in a couple weeks. What's the hurt? We'll give our expert in a month. Oh, our expert's now not available for this trial date, judge. But if you keep the screws, keep them, keep them to the screws, keep the screws on them, whatever, whatever that, uh, one liner is they've got to tell you, they've got to give you all the discovery. They've got to give you all their expert witnesses. They've got to file all their motions. Sometimes you'll even take trial depositions. It's locked in. The testimony's locked in. The evidence is locked in. They can't add to it. If everything closes and sometimes you waive speedy trial, you can be like, judge, keep all the deadlines we already have. 
Keep discovery closed. They should not be able to add anything to this case. And if you wait until the last minute to, to waive speedy trial, you keep those deadlines locked in. You ask the judge to hold the state to those deadlines. And even if you continue the case a month, the evidence is not going to change in a material way. Facey Cad, how can the judge push 37 days and take it back? Isn't that unfair to Koberger? So, I mean, I think they could have, it was weird that they didn't really make an argument like, judge, we still need those 37 days. Like, look at how much you're talking about, how hard all this is. Part of that is because we had to waste time on this grand jury stuff because the state kept delaying. And you obviously agreed we had to waste time on it. You gave us 37 days. Let us keep the 37 days. Maybe we can have one continuance without waiving speedy trial. Azam, hey, Peter, if the defense waives the speedy trial, is there a limit on how long before the trial begins? Thanks, Peter. So there are different ways that you can try to still force a quicker trial or say in the interest of justice. But once you waive, the case materially changes. Things outside your control just happen to start continuing the case. The judge's docket, oh, I've got another trial that's older than yours that's on the docket, so we have to push yours back. All sorts of issues pop up once you waive speedy trial. Unresolved crimes. The defense proving a point with so much witnesses with a biological background or IgG background is the entire essence of that field being faulty. Okay. I don't think the judge felt that way. Uh, does net woman, does Idaho require the state prove motive? No. Miraculous Hufflepuff. Is it better for defense to keep speedy or waive it? I mean, it's, it's better for them to keep it at this point. Where it transitions to become better for them to waive it is if they're unprepared for trial. You don't go to trial unprepared and do a bad job just because you're like, oh, ha-ha, we got this thing to go within six months. John, isn't all the evidence for trial already collected? Why doesn't the state back up the truck and produce everything it has? Oh, it would be so nice and easy, John, if that was the case. But somehow, they're still waiting on a lab report. They're going to make an additional inquiry to the FBI and to law enforcement if they have anything else. In the Murdoch case, the OnStar data showed up during trial. So many times, evidence is still collected. And I mean, in the YNW Melly case, a lot of evidence came out during trial or way late in the process. Sometimes that's what happens, and it's frustrating. Belinda, love your fair and unbiased analysis. You would make a great judge one day. Ever think about that career path? Much love to you and your team from France, Belinda. I don't think I could ever do it. It just seems kind of boring to be a judge. It's not for me. It's not for me. I like the action too much. I love talking about it with you all and getting your opinions on it. Great Dane mom. Question, is the defense using speedy trial as a tactic? Maybe. We don't know. We're not in the room with them. Uh, Beth, hi, Peter. I am so moved by your argument and giving us insight and knowledge. Thank you very much, Peter. Best from Denmark. Thank you so much, Beth. It's crazy. We got France in here. We got Denmark. All these people are interested in our process. And then, of course, a lot of Americans interested in the process that affects them and their loved ones. Interesting. It's a great way to learn. Robin, question. Why is it mandatory for the state to turn over anything DNA related if it's mainly the reason they caught him? Because there is a line to where it has to stop and certain things don't exist where that line is and DNA stuff is just so new. So we're still basically molding the law and the rules around it. And we haven't fully pinned down exactly how we in the legal profession are going to handle DNA evidence. Rebecca, is this creating an appellate issue? It could. I think the judge has done a really great job. I like his demeanor a lot. I like how he keeps it about as lighthearted as you can in situations like this that are the most serious of situations. I don't think any appellate issues have been created so far. Doesn't mean ones won't come in the future. No probable anything needed to sample trash. Depends. Gene, welcome. And Jessica, some new members here. And Glenna. Azam, I appreciate you so much, Peter. Right back at you. Edward, hi, Peter. So what happens if speedy trial is violated? It seems like this is a definite defense strategy. The state took forever to get discovered to defense. No, I think every single time they do take a while, it's another argument that the defense is going to make. If they violate speedy trial, the one of the sanctions is the indictment is dismissed and Brian Koberger goes home. Now, it's not guaranteed what's going to happen. If you look at Lori Vallow, it was like Judge Boyce was like, 
kind of violated speedy trial. So I'm going to pull the death penalty off the table. And there were these other, you know, competency issues and delays and stays in the case. So we're going to still have her go to trial, but we're just going to pull the death penalty off the table. So there are some ways you can split the baby. And, you know, I wouldn't call it yet. I'd be absolutely shocked if they say the state violated his speedy trial rights and end up dismissing the indictment. I think what's going to end up happening is the judge is going to say denied. That motion is denied. You can waive your right to speedy trial and we will continue the case. Even if it's October 1st, that's the remedy. I think the judge would say He's like, I will, I will violate my own order. Basically saying that you had till September 8th. I will give you now on October 2nd, the day of trial. If you want to waive speedy trial, that's fine. But I'm not going to find that they violated your speedy trial rights and dismiss this case. Which again, at that point, it will be an appellate issue. Just because something's an appellate issue doesn't mean it's a winner. The vast majority of appeals lose. So just because somebody says, oh, that's an appellate issue, that doesn't mean it's going to get overturned. Lorraine, if I'm a defendant, do I want a speedy trial? What's the benefit and the downside? If you can be ready to try the case, sure. Um, but if the state's already ready, is there any benefit to it? Sometimes there's not. I would say you'd rather let your team catch up and prepare the case. And the vast majority of cases, good defense lawyers are not going to be able to do that within six months. They're not going to drop everything and just work on one case for six months. So give them the time they need to appropriately prepare your case. Deb, wouldn't it be bad if the defense got the judge mad at them? So most good judges, and I feel this way about Judge Judge so far, just kind of listening to him and his demeanor. Most good judges don't get mad at lawyers. And even if they do get mad at lawyers, they don't let it affect their ruling. Sometimes it can. And sometimes it can be personal from, you know, years back and doesn't just happen on one case. Most lawyers have reputations, which is why your reputation is incredibly important in the legal field. Among other lawyers, among lawyers that work on the other side, among lawyers in your practice area with respect and sharing ideas and working with each other. And then even more importantly, to judges. They know who the good trial lawyers are. More importantly, they know who the ethical lawyers are, who they can trust what they say. That's more important than a judge getting mad and giving you bad rulings. Jamie, much love from Ireland. You guys are blowing my mind with how much around the world we are today. Okay, this is an awesome community. Thank you, Peter, for your time and expertise. I could not agree more. And I think this is a great comment to end on. Um, hit that like button, almost 7,000 people in the chat today. That's absolutely wild. One of our bigger ones, and especially for a Monday afternoon. So please hit that like button. Let's get this like, let's get this to 10,000 likes on this video and share it with your friends. If anybody's talking about this hearing or has questions, I'll do some follow-up. We'll obviously continue to follow this case. It's going to be moving at rapid light speed at this point. So we will be following it together. Make sure you subscribe and hit that reminder bell if you haven't already. And if you're brand new, let me know in the chat. If you're brand new, just recently, let me know. Belinda, great to know if I ever come to Miami from Europe and get in trouble. I have the lawyer you know. Yes, you do. And anybody you know over here, um, you absolutely do. And actually, my firm specializes in wrongful death, injury cases, truck accidents, premises liability, car accidents, stuff like that. Um, so if you want to hear more about what we do, I am a real lawyer. I know I'm wearing a hoodie, got long hair. I don't have a scruffy beard anymore. It's cleaned up a little bit. I am going to get my hair trimmed a little bit, but I am a real lawyer, handle these cases. Um, so if you guys want to hear more about that, stick around for the outro. Uh, Jay or Raylene is brand new as of a few minutes ago. That is so awesome. Um, DJ, if the judge takes death penalty off the table, would the prosecution proceed with the case or would they try to dismiss it and bring the case again? They'd probably proceed with the case, try to convict him and get him life in prison. That's what they did in Lori Vallow. I don't know the answer, but that would just be my guess. All right. I appreciate everybody. And pay attention to the outro if you want to know what we do. If not, I'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Tragos Law is our handle. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast featuring new episodes every week. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.